So in order to kickstart the conversation, I would like to request Bilal कि वो रोशनी डालें अपनी statistical insights की नजर में कि COVID-19 का बिलखसूस पाकिस्तान के मौशी हालात पर क्या असर होगा और आलमी सतह पर जो मौशी लिहाज से तब्दीलियां आ रही हैं वो पाकिस्तान में सरमायाकारी को किस तरह मुदाफत um thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present um uh, we, we've been tracking the the public perception as well as the perception of the businesses throughout the corona times in pakistan um and we've also been keeping up a tab of other economic indicators that are coming from pakistan and elsewhere in the world um i i so we recently did a business confidence uh, survey with uh, with sme businesses uh, medium sized businesses large scale businesses um and we saw that um the the business confidence was uh, significantly down um during the covid times and there was a significant pessimism about how the businesses perceived if there was a post covid time scenario um there was a lot of pessimism uh, about it as well so um the business situation net score um as we call it um uh, our business confidence index um it was during the current quarter uh, before the covid times it was already in the negative um but it fell by about 68% um and um, further so I, i think one of the the situations um, that we need to keep into mind about pakistan is that um the economy was uh, in significant uh, decline um due, before the corona struck so because of the demand compression and other measures um the economy was already reeling um and then the 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 covid lockdown struck um so so the business confidence is significantly down uh, if one looks into the large scale manufacturing um the the results released very recently by the Uh, by pbs um the index of the um uh, of large scale manufacturing uh, it has fell by 35% points um in march uh, that doesn't completely reflect the lockdown and its impact as you would know the lockdown only started on the 21st um of march in in Kara- in sin uh, and then later on in punjab so the first 20 days of march um even though the the um the lockdown was not there uh, we see that a, a lot of businesses had already started anticipating uh, how things were not going all right and they had, they uh, the the index shows that the contraction happened significantly so if you look at the distribution um of the large scale manufacturing and its contraction in march uh, we look at about 50% fall um in in automobile industry 57% in electronics uh, 35% in engineering um about 100% in wood products um so if, if one goes ahead um in terms of the worker remittances um the the uh, there is a significant i mean there are different projections that are happening and uh, the numbers um, that are have been recently released um uh, for the month of april um they 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 seem they seem to give some hope but if you look at the uh, if you look at the the details of the of the remittances uh, data out of the th- top 13 countries only two countries uh, show a positive uh, increase where the us represents about a 50% increase um so our understanding is that the remittance um, uh, data for the april may give a, a little false picture as to what is about to come um but then there are different um uh, predictions to this but most of the predictions would suggest a significant fall and given the the importance of the worker remittances not just for um the local economy um the local investment situation in terms of remittances uh, fueling consumption but also fueling uh, investment in construction sector for example um uh, these are these are very significant numbers and uh, the world bank uh, projections for across the world on worker remittances also suggest that the market may be looking for a very sharp decline um this together with um the the fall in the oil prices um, um and pakistani worker remittances at least a 50% coming from the 
the Middle Eastern market, which is um, which is very heavily oil dependent, and there's fifty percent coming from um, the UK and the US. Um, these the worker remittances, I think, is a uh, is is something that we really need to look for because um, that that could spell uh, the 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 current account deficit uh, deteriorating in spite of the the oil um, uh, gains that we're looking at. Um, very recently, Hisab Kitab, um, which is a, a very interesting um, software uh, application, they've released their data, which shows that um, that there has been a 70% decline in the food industry in Pakistan, uh, about a 21% decline in uh, eating out uh, numbers, um, and but they also suggest that um, the the decline in the eating out and the restaurant industry is to some extent um, taken over by the grocery market. Uh, so people are essentially switching between one sector to the other. Um, so that's one interesting feature that maybe maybe we can look into um, later in the conversation if there are winners um, uh, of, this, of this crisis in Pakistan and whether the industry and the service sector can essentially adapt itself to, um, to um, um, bear the, the the losses coming out of it in a more even way. Um, in terms of the the public opinion and um, how the the low, the micro economy has been affected, uh, these were all very macro numbers. Uh, but if you look at the household level, um, we we recently did a survey and we see three main findings coming from the micro economy at the household level. Uh, there is a significant food insecurity fear. There is a financial insecurity fear, and there is now a significant reliance on outside help um, in Pakistan. So in terms of the food security, about 6.9 million households um, uh, in Pakistan, about a quarter of the households um, say to us that they have reduced the number or size of meals um, for some family members. Um, and this is, a, this is a very devastating figure because uh, um, we're talking about not just a quarter of a million households, but several million individuals. And food insecurity um, has a very um, uh, uneven um, uh, impact on the household and its members. We know that uh, the deprived uh, sections of the community, of the household, um, they are more aggravatedly affected by it. So when there's food insecurity, uh, um, younger children are affected more, um, the female ch children are affected more. Um, so um, in terms of the financial insecurity, about one in five say they had to lean on their savings to cover, cover basic uh, household needs. Um, uh, about 10 million individuals are saying that they are trying to additionally earn um, money. Um, this is in addition to about 80% reporting that there has been a significant loss um, of their um, of the income. Um, and uh, about 3 million households say that they are now actively dependent on um, other than government NGO assistance. So I, I, want, I just wanted to put uh, the, the current picture as it appears to us um, before we start talking about the future because the, the the future is dependent on the on the present, um, and it provides some context to the to the to the conversation and our ability to uh, predict how things would be and our ability to to assist the government uh, through this forum uh, on what can be done. Thank you, Bilal, uh, for laying out all the essential facts for us, which can help us with our conversation here. And now I would like to steer the conversation uh, to identifying that how all what Bilal has said, which reflects a uh, low in business confidence, a uh, reduction in consumption overall, a uh, reduction in the large scale manufacturing uh, industries, uh, growth rate and uh, challenges such as food insecurity looming over us. So I would like to steer this conversation to uh, Nadeem uh, Javed Sa, uh, to get his uh, input and to get his insights that how all these factors, when we take into account all these factors, how this will affect the global economy and what potential rearrangements uh, will be required to make. And uh, in Pakistan particularly, how this will then translate into the economic landscape in Pakistan. So, sir, if you can shed, shed your wisdom on this 
on 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 this thank you ahmed for the opportunity and so i think uh, whatsoever has been uh, highlighted by bilal uh, is uh, when we look at in i mean global context the situation is like uh, i mean both the global economy and then the domestic economy is they are reinforcing this uh, i mean downturn uh, into uh, each other uh, and there's a kind of an a co evolution sort of an arrangement that's going on so uh, the most important aspect uh, are yet to i mean uh, come and they have uh, or they could have even more profound uh, implications for the uh, for the livelihoods uh, in the days to come because if you look at then uh, normally you you have to divide this uh, impact in two steps the first step is that economic impact of the virus spread and normally if you look at then most of the public health systems uh, they uh, they imposed lockdowns uh, travel bans then uh, comprehensive uh, you can say that uh, contact tracing uh, then provision of this uh, i mean health capacity equipment uh, all these things uh, were in the first step and those has caused the immediate effect but subsequently there would be another uh, i mean ripple effect uh, and there is uh, you, you could call it a knock on effect uh, of these uh, i mean public health responses and the, those are primarily causing the unemployment to increase then uh, most of the businesses which i mean uh, bilal has also pointed out particularly uh, restaurants and some food businesses those those are uh, i mean closely uh, there is a shutdown then corp then subsequently there would be corporate failures uh, and then credit uh, defaults particularly uh, posing a lot more uh, serious challenge for the uh, for the banking uh, industry and the financial system of the countries and that would be even much more uh, i mean uh, complicated as compared to what we are discussing at at the moment so i mean this knock on effect would be i think should be uh, and would be the concern of any government that how to mitigate its negative uh, repercussions or implications in the days to come so uh, i mean one thing is quite clear when we are going to evaluate its impact on the global level so this uh, phenomenon of globalization there was to a large extent uh, getting uh, i mean uh, kind of a momentum or traction uh, in the past there was derailed by having this uh, i mean uh, china us trade war that was going on uh, in the global context and roughly uh, speaking that uh, 7 780 billion dollars worth of trade was already jeopardized by having some stringent tariff and non tariff measures which have been taken in the i mean recent past i mean i'm not talking about uh, i mean uh, three four quarters rather it was just roughly i mean uh, two or three weeks before the corona hit china uh, the situation was like this and then this uh, pandemic has further deepened this uh, reversal of globalization uh, and now if you look at then the forecast for europe and america are much more severe as compared to what the kind of downturn they had faced in in the face of global financial crisis in 2008 uh, so i mean at, at that time the contraction was about 4.5% uh, in in europe and it was around 5.5% uh, in uh, us uh, market but now it is being expected that it would be around 7.4% in europe and there it would be around uh, 9% in uh, united states of america so i mean if these two major markets of the world are going to contract by this much percentage and then uh, i mean uh, more adding fuel to the fire uh, most of these i mean uh, oil rich countries which are also facing the problem because of having this opec crisis and then subsequently corona implications on their uh, i mean oil prices 
is further going to uh, uh, complicate the things because in global financial crisis, the situation was not so grave as it is now in particularly these oil rich countries as well. So I mean, together this uh, Europe, US and then oil rich uh, countries are going to once contract, these are going to have severe implications for the countries like us. Particularly, we are exporting very, I mean, uh, low value added stuff that is highly price sensitive. And eventually, if there would be a kind of uh, low income levels in these countries and the similar kind of situation as uh, Bilal has pointed out, the low level of consumer confidence, low spending, low investments. So then eventually the countries like us would be the hard hit uh, countries because we are the ones who are selling this, I mean, roughly around uh, 19, 20 billion dollars worth of our exports are very, I mean, low value added products. Mm -hmm. So first of all, there would be a severe decline in those products. And then mm -hmm. subsequently, there would be a decline in the remittances. And uh, I mean, as per certain forecast by IMF and World Bank, roughly it would be, I mean, 15 to 23% decline in the subsequent quarter. And the reason being, I mean, this is not being reflected in the uh, April numbers as uh, uh, Bilal has pointed out, because if you look at then Saudi Arabia, UAE, I mean, most of these countries from where our remittances are coming. So they have ensured, uh, I mean, for six week salaries to their staff uh, in advance uh, in, 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 in previous month. So because of that, there was no such a kind of uh, severe decline in the in the remittances for the month of April. But now for the month of May, I think there would be certain, uh, I mean, signs of this uh, decline. And then together, uh, I mean, having this decline in exports numbers and then uh, these uh, uh, remittances are going to create uh, the same situation the kind of we had uh, on our current account uh, balance. So that's all. Um, uh, I would, uh, I mean, uh, conclude by, uh, uh, I mean, summing up this discussion that uh, the shadows uh, would be much more severe as compared to the global financial crisis because that's the kind of a benchmark we have uh, up till now. And uh, the countries like us, Pakistan, uh, we are going to have a severe, uh, I mean, implications on our economic growth and as well as on, 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 on the livelihoods of uh, particularly those uh, people who are working or who are drawing their uh, livelihoods from the informal sector. And unfortunately, the numbers suggest uh, from the labor force surveys that roughly 70% of our labor force, that's around 36 million uh, I mean, uh, people are drawing their livelihoods from the informal sector. So, I mean, those should be the serious concern for the government. And once, I mean, we will be uh, talking about the, uh, the fifth uh, question, I will talk about that as well. So, I think we can safely assume that this COVID-19 uh, uh, has uh, made us face the biggest economic challenge of our times and uh, has established that its impact is across all the sectors of the economy and will have implications for all segments of the society. So Nahid, I would like to request you to please uh, share some insights that uh, what potential economic rearrangements in our uh, overall economic setup in Pakistan we can try to look into in order to limit the impact of COVID-19 and in order to safeguard uh, the vulnerable segments of our society. So if you can please shed some light on this. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I'll begin from, um, you know, like picking up from where uh, the sub left off, starting with the point on globalization. Um, so yes, it is very valid that uh, this sort of the entire globalization spree um, has now taken a backseat. And we will be looking at, as we go forward, um, 
more localization, more regional uh, business, more, uh, more internal uh, growth. I see this as a huge opportunity for Pakistan. If I were going to think about what I would do tomorrow, I would raise protectionism. I would say that this is an opportunity that um, we probably missed out on earlier. Um, uh, I mean, India had this whole license Raj, the whole Nehru era. I mean, we all understand what that was all about. It was all about made in India. It was all about, uh, you know, I remember um, going there and having thumbs up and coming back to Pakistan and saying, oh, we have Coca-Cola and driving all these fancy cars here, whereas over there you had the Marutis and the ambassadors and so on. But look what happened then. They actually built themselves. They built their industrial machine. They built their backbone. They built that whole, uh, and based on a domestic growth, not just an export growth. Whereas we did not really get onto the bandwagon. And then slowly what happened to us was that we were no longer competitive. We could not be competitive because, I mean, the only reason, the only place where we found ourselves to be competitive was a low cost labor industrial base. And what was that? Textile, for example, and so on. So our entire focus was just on that. On a few industries like that, it were very high labor, you know, labor intensive and that's where you were um, going. But we could not really then get on to that. You know, you spoke about large scale manufacturing and how that's fallen. Well, in Pakistan, that never really took off. So that's one. So I see what's happening now as an opportunity for Pakistan to actually build that whole made in Pakistan. Let's build our industry and let's now, because we would not be able to, um, obviously with the whole current account deficit, the fiscal deficits are gonna be very high and that whole economic situation, the way it's gonna pan out is not just for us, but it's gonna be for most countries. So our ability to import our reserves and so on and so forth is gonna put a huge pressure on our uh, economy anyways. So from that economic aspect, plus from an opportunity aspect, I would say that it, this is a real a big, big opportunity for local industry to be patronized and given a chance. And not just by saying it, you need to have a sectoral focused approach and really attack it. The word is properly attack it. Um, so that's one. And then um, there was a discussion about debt and how the debt is going to increase and how there'll be defaults and how there'll be corporate defaults. Of course, that'll be the case. The finance sector in this country to finally wake up. If you ask me, they've done nothing for this country. I mean, really, the banking, et cetera, they've just been commercial sharks. So if you talk about debt restructuring, if you talk about uh, building your equity markets, your capital markets, uh, bringing more money in through there and encouraging these industries to actually develop with public funds, with, uh, with restructuring these and so that these industries that we want to encourage can actually um, take off. Um, so I, I see a big role for the finance industry in general. I see a big role for the banks to take a lead. I see a big role for monetary policy uh, collectively to actually encourage all this to happen. Um, and then speaking about industries and you know how what individual sort of sectors or can do, there was a mention of that, and I think someone just mentioned about a, um, a switching you know, from one sector to another, how one can move to the other. And that's exactly what's going to happen. We'll all have to adapt. And I think what's really happened is that we've just been pushed forward five years. What is happening now, uh, this, this, this whole online IT, uh, virtual sort of businesses and, and this growth, we were already moving in that direction. Um, and now we're suddenly there, we're there. The, the, those 10 years just happened in three months, the way I look at it. So I think that uh, businesses need to very quickly adapt. They need to be thinking. I mean, I wish I was 30 years old today. That's what I'm thinking. Because then I would think about, and I know young people especially feel very disheartened. They feel, oh God, how are they going to grow? How, what careers are they going to be now in and so on? I think this is a great time for them to be where they are because everything is sort of being reset. Um, your gurus of the, of the world, you know, your Warren Rufus of the world are now, uh, divesting, they're selling stock, people are moving out because they, are, they don't have the stamina now to reset. The young people do. So I see a huge opening up yesterday about a virtual mm. trade show, which I found really interesting. Do you know how you have these big conference rooms and these big exhibition halls and you have these trade shows and everyone physically going there? Replicate this virtually. And someone was like this Chinese uh, targeted. It can't just be 
you know, sort of groping in the dark. You need need to have a game plan here about how you encourage your local employment problem will not be i mean it won't i don't see as i don't see long term long term unemployment to be persistent i don't think so i think industry will revive and i think new industries will come up it's just a case of resetting um, and how we go about doing it so oh, thank you for what's needed uh, but like like you said and like what bilal said that there will be some winners and some losers uh, uh, pandemic which we are facing globally on whatever available opportunity um, it needs to be at a place where um, or thought ye di jati thi ke hamare kuch bottlenecks hain jaise ki infrastructural bottlenecks hain energy bottlenecks hain aur humne abhi recent past mein dekha ke uh, pakistan ne bil khusus biruni sarmayedari ko uh, uh, ko hasil karne ke liye ko koshishein ki jiske nateeje mein chin pakistan इकतदी रादारी जैसे मनसूबे हमें देखने में नजर आए जो कि फोकस करते थे इन बॉटल नेक्स को ओवरकम करने में ताकि पाकिस्तान एक्चुअलाइज कर सके अपनी ट्रू इकोनॉमिक पोटेंशियल तो मेरा अगला सवाल हसन खावर साहब और हसन दाऊद साहब से दोनों से होएगा क्योंकि वो इसमें एक्सपर्टीज रखते हैं इसमें महारत रखते हैं उन्होंने इस पर काम किया है बहुत ज्यादा कि बिलखसूस पाकिस्तान में बैरूनी सर मैं दारी के लिहाज से चीन सर फहरिस्त हमें नजर आता है और उसके नतीजे में ये जो अभी बातें हो रही थी कि जो बॉटल नेक्स हैं वो भी हमें टूटते हुए नजर आ रहे थे इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चरल प्रोजेक्ट्स के नतीजे में स्पेशल इकोनॉमिक जोन्स की डेवलपमेंट के नतीजे में तो अच्छे से समझते हैं कि कोविड की वजह से एक तो ओवरऑल At, at, at an overall level, आप क्या समझते हैं कि फॉरन डायरेक्ट इन्वेस्टमेंट किस हद तक मुतासर होगी पाकिस्तान में और चीन की जो सरमायादारी है पाकिस्तान के अंदर बिलखसूस इन मनसूबों से जो जुड़ी हुई है क्या आप उसको भी देखते हैं नजर उसको भी असरअंदाज होता हुआ देखते हैं या उसके क्या असरा आप देखते हैं तो इस पर आपसे गुजारिश है इफ आई कैन स्टार्ट विद हसन दाउद साहब एंड हसन हसान खावर कैन यू नो एड टू इट दिस इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग एंड एंड दिस विल हेल्प अलॉट टू अंडरस्टैंड वट Effect to what to what an effect Pakistan's economy will be had. The other positive that I see, Ahmed, I can hear Salis Urdu coming out of you. So this is a positive impact, you know, of uh, COVID-19. Besides this, I think Charles Dickens would be very happy in it, you know, reminding us all of his uh, tales of two cities, from light to darkness, and from euphoria to disgrace. I think. uh we living in uh, interesting times uh, things are changing fast uh, uh, some positive some negative uh before actually uh, covid uh, 19 hit us in march uh, say about 23rd of march uh, in khaiba pakhtunkhwa we were actually working on uh, redefining our uh, structure and also looking at new possibilities of attracting uh, fdi because uh, we were Uh, in our uh, huddles, we were uh, quite clear that this day would be relocation happening because of you know the U.S.-China trade war, and now with COVID and the kind of risk that has uh, it has highlighted, I think uh, further relocation would take place. So this is one point that we are uh, revising our industrial policy, uh, uh, giving more incentives to to people to invest in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, especially in newly merged districts, because we have. this huge uh, uh, land mass which is available cost of land is steep um, human resources uh, um, you know hard working but having said that uh, for us at this point uh, brashakai remains a key uh, you know deliverable where we want to get a, get over with the uh, bureaucratic channel as soon as possible and Go ahead with the groundbreaking. As per my personal impression and have and the discussions that I have had with Chinese in the last say four weeks, even during COVID, there was a lot of attention from the Chinese side in terms of queries that I was getting in uh, KP Board of Investment. Likewise, some Chinese steel manufacturers have already moved to Russia. Kai they bought land. Uh, Pakistani manufacturers are looking at Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Hatar, Russia. Kai. in terms of their investment but while we uh, our businesses and our classroom move to living room there would be you know profound changes i also see uh, because the government was working on a, its e-commerce policy and lot of 
work i think some um, some progress and fast progress would happen that way in in terms of uh, redefining our roles and also the the structure make it making it easier for especially women entrepreneurs to come female entrepreneurs to come and participate uh, you know a lot of because i was engaged in uh, um, you know my connection for uh, private sector to support the government of khyber pakhtunkhwa in in combating uh, covid 19 so a lot of female entrepreneurs approach us in in uh, in health sector and uh, wanted us to you know guide them through the this process some young doctors actually approaches in telemedicine so there a lot of hope for khyber pakhtunkhwa specifically and for pakistan perhaps in pharmaceutical sector uh, also uh, in agriculture because we were already in the process of improving our uh, agriculture sector which is per per unit yield by far the lowest in the region and the kind of uh, you know natural endowment we have and we were working on leveraging it we also see uh, tourism jumping back quickly because most of our uh, consumers in that sector were uh, domestic we do not see kind of time but we do see as soon as soon as this covid lockdowns are over a lot of people would come and uh, attract the uh, tourism sector where we are offering a lot of incentives again in terms of tourist uh, for pakistan and investment by china means uh, there is uh, i i think the chinese tourists would relocate to countries close to them like cambodia like malaysia even to pakistan if we offer them the kind of uh, services that other countries uh, offer and similarly we need to actually work on and there is a debate going on we were in board of investment just last week and talking about our in- incentive package we need to revise our incentive package based on what is happening uh, across the globe and structure it well based on our competitors if we do that at uh, i mean at kp we are willing to do that in at provincial level but naturally it has to go through the board of investment so um, i i think if we do that we will be able to attract investment coming to, uh, to pakistan and there is hope there but having said that i think we need to improve our governance we need to improve uh, especially e governance should come in now uh I, I, the other positive that i look and i have been speaking about is that uh, we might enter the fourth industrial revolution faster than we we want to or we wanted to uh, because now uh, with the digital uh, world would expand and uh, with uh, perhaps we will enter uh, 5g earlier because china is now willing to support pakistan in in way we also lastly because uh, um i would let some uh, power because he writes a lot about uh, on bri i i think based on the discussion that we had with the cpec authority and their discussion with the chinese chinese are willing to support us in agriculture also in e-commerce and uh, perhaps in the infrastructure uh, we need to prioritize uh, as we did earlier on, on the early harvest and perhaps the short term goals that we want to grow from move forward in a uh, put our bags uh, full of ideas and just go to china each time and then come back with uh, with a sorry figure we need to uh, actually prioritize our requirement and then approach china the way the chinese for financial sector they need to be jolted and uh, uh, from their commercial aspect i think they need to lens where provinces like uh, khyber is suffering a lot so we are talking with our bank of khyber unfortunately the first department to hit by covid was our bank of khyber their md was was diagnosed with uh, covid 19 so the bank, bank operations were halted for a little while but now we back into game the government is working uh, closely i am happy to report that uh, the current government of khyber pakhtunkhwa is quite pragmatic thank you uh, hasan aap bhi isme if you want to add particularly in the context of scs and uh, how bris uh, chunk for thodi si usme kuch char panch baatein pehle karna chahta hu ki hame kuch cheezon ko we have to take stock of a few developments 
that are happening. And even before I say that, I think uh, whatever we are talking about, of course, have a huge shadow of uncertainty looming over it. Because we don't know what post-COVID world would look like, whether there is going to be a post-COVID world or whether we'll have to live with COVID uh, for a long duration of time. And even in Pakistan, uh, lockdown is easing up, but we have seen the number of cases uh, going growing very, very rapidly. Although, luckily, the death rate is not as high as we have seen in some of the OECD countries. So I think there are positives and negatives. So whatever we say is bound to change as the situation evolves. But I think, nevertheless, there are a few things that we need to be uh, aware of. The first is uh, that after, and, and if we talk uh, in the larger context of Belt and Road Initiative, and of course, Pakistan is a part of it. So I think going forward, countries would be needing more financing and they would be much more open to accessing any source of finance because for multilateral financing, there is going to be a huge competition. So if Chinese have the money to offer, first, there are going to be many takers for that. Uh, whether they'd have it or not, I think that's another question. The second is that while countries would be very much open to get new money, they'd be hard pressed to pay back the, the older loans. Uh, because uh, even if the, there were any uh, public private partnership projects, uh, the revenues are going to fall, the country's capacity to pay back debt is going to shrink substantially. And you know that Pakistan has already asked G20 and others to kind of restructure its debt. And I think it's the same for many other developing countries. So the investments that have already been made, I think they are likely to suffer from disruptions in uh, cash outflows and repayments. So I think that's third. A second. The third is that when you come to uh, Pakistan especially, I think there is an ongoing conversation on IPPs and capacity payments. And I think that is quite central to how Pak China uh, policy on CPEC is going to move forward. Because the news is coming out that Pakistan has already requested China to uh, reduce the interest rate on the existing energy projects. And it has also requested China to uh, change the, the structure to kind of extend the debt repayment terms on those projects from 10 years to 20 years. I'm not sure what China's response is going to be. Probably they'd agree to some because they know that Pakistan is in a, a tough spot. But I think uh, the IPP conversation, it has to be managed well, not to allow uh, one of the largest sponsors in the world. So I think that's third. The fourth is, and I think uh, Nadeem Saab and Hassan Saab and others have also kind of alluded to that, uh, that the world as we know it is changing and the market structure and the trade structure is going to change. And I do believe that for China, uh, MENA region, Middle East, North Africa will resume greater importance uh, as, uh, as import markets in US and Europe are going to shrink. And as soon as China's interest in MENA increases further, I think Pakistan's importance both due to connectivity and its geostrategic location, the weather and everything, it's going to increase. So I think Pakistan is not going to lose its important importance there. Uh, the next thing is, and again, I'm just kind of summarizing because many of our panelists have talked about it, are the opportunity sectors. And there are sectors that are going to gain, which need to inform government policy. So we do know that IT and many of its sub-segments are going to the fisheries. Agriculture sector is likely to suffer less because mostly of inelastic demand. Um, logistics, I think, would assume greater importance. And even health-related sectors, I think, are going to be very important. Uh, you also talked about FDI. And I think we must uh, realize that the competition to get FDI would be cutthroat going forward. Each and every country would be racing to offer incentives uh, for any possible sources of FDI. And I think even when you look at Pakistan, I think we are going to face domestic competition. As provinces are going to face the need of investment, uh, we would see KP, Punjab, Sindh, and even Balochistan kind of 
mobilizing its their efforts to offer incentives to incoming investors because the investors would be fewer and the needs would be greater so i think that competition is going to be there and uh, lastly i think the government's ability to intervene through a fiscal stimulus through infrastructure investments through public investments is going to be far smaller and if you uh, would refer to the ongoing conversation on the 10th nfc award on 18th amendment we can very clearly see that uh, the, the the resources are shrinking and tensions are rising and i think there is it's the issue is going to be very very contentious so if we believe that federal government or even any provincial government would be able to spend significant amounts of money in infrastructure or in or in in to 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 mobilize investments or maybe special economic zones hugely i think that's going to be uh, a little bit more difficult now what it means for um for for us is in terms of a policy response that as government's ability to put in a fiscal stimulus or to put in hard cash uh, is going to be limited they are going to be reliant more and more on policy reforms on softer reforms on interventions that do not need money i think they would be of paramount importance so when we talk about special economic zones because special economic zones are not as in, as investment intensive as let's suppose a railway project or something else so i think that's not going to be a problem but i think more than the infrastructure investments uh, the regulatory reform is going to be important because uh in in an environment where there is a huge competition for fdi i think the tolerance in the investors to bear with the red tape is going to be much less and if any province that can succeed or that is going to do a good job in improving its regulatory environment within its scc is probably going to be a winner at least in in relative terms compared to the other other provinces uh so i think Uh, SECs and softer reforms are the key words. The 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 other one is that government would need to get out of the traditional public investment paradigm, and I think it would really need to now rely on private sector investment, uh, both purely private investments as well as private investment infrastructure, which means public private partnerships, and that is something that we have talked about a lot in the past. I think Pakistan also had. uh has had a track record of uh, ppps but only in a few sectors like energy i think that would need to kind of uh, go out of that energy sector and pakistan and the provinces are going to need private investments in infrastructure services and in a number of number of other areas uh, uh and i think uh, something that uh, hasan daud saab said i think that was very interesting that the tourism in kp is likely to pick up because there are not going to be international tourists there are going to be more domestic tourists i think that is the key that going forward we need to have a domestic focus as well as the world is kind of going through a metamorphosis or morphism and the the sources of financing are going to dry up i think we need to have a domestically focused strategy when we talk about investments we need to mobilize domestic investors as well because that is going to be a saving grace for pakistan and i think lastly i would uh, uh, refer to what nahid said about restructuring the industrial landscape uh, of uh, of pakistan and of different provinces and i think we all talk about the opportunity sectors and i just refer to them like it and agriculture and logistics and others but i think the real question to ask is that are these new opportunities informing our policy response when we talk about secs are we looking at these opportunity sectors when we look at industrial policy are we looking at these sectors and i think in at some places we might be so for example when we are planning for a special economic zones it might be easier to talk about the opportunity sectors but when we talk about the political economy of our industrial policy when we decide whether to how to treat the five export sectors uh, how to kind of Uh, treat the subsidies going to uh, the large industries how to treat the sugar industry the textile people the cement cartel i think those are the real contentious issues because whether we like it or not going forward 
Pakistan and for that matter many other countries would not have much money to spare. So I think we must realize that the party that has been going on for the last 70 years is over. And the sooner we realize it, I think the better we'd be. Thank you. So from what I can gather, thank you, Hassan, for so comprehensively contextualizing the challenges uh, uh, for Pakistan, uh, challenges due to COVID. So from what I gather, we have uh, discussed at length the uh, pull factors in Pakistan, the economic factors in Pakistan, and I think we can conclude that their uh, relevance is very Pakistan-specific. For example, its st strategic importance, its, uh, uh, its uh, labor force, and all those factors. But then there are some other factors as well, which uh, uh, has a large bearing on our economy, such as the remittances inflow. And we know from the reports and from the statistics and from the global e economic conditions that they will take a major hit. So in the light of whatever has been said here today, I would like to come back to all of you uh, to uh, understand uh, Hassan has already provided us with certain policy responses uh, responses that the government should look into and the uh, private sector should also look into. But I would like to come back to all of you that in the light of the discussion we have had, what way forward do you envision and what policy recommendations you can uh, give here today which we can present to the government and can also share in the civil society, academia and uh, policy specialists at large so that we can collectively initiate this course at this level which can help Pakistan uh, uh, benefit from the potential opportunities and can help limit the impact, the socio-economic impact. So I would like to go back to all of you, starting from Nadine Javes. Uh, very shortly, if you can shed light on what way forward do you envision for Pakistan, for, any, for the economic responses and other, other responses. On this question, once again, uh, we, we need to look at the kind of time uh, spectrum which the research or some I mean, experts are highlighting. And uh, roughly the timeline uh, is around, I mean, 14 to 18 months that uh, we are going to, I mean, continue to face this, uh, I mean, problem uh, of Corona until uh, some uh, vaccine or other, uh, I mean, uh, cure is uh, available. So, I mean, keeping in view this, uh, I mean, uh, time uh, in mind, first of all, I think government needs to uh, to set certain, I mean, uh, uh, protocols, uh, particularly to induce some behavioral change uh, among the citizens. Otherwise, it would not be possible to, to, to manage it because you can't, I mean, have uh, lockdowns for, uh, I mean, prolonged time periods. I mean, uh, even if you are going to open them, then there would be no, let's see what happens. But uh, generally speaking, there could be, I mean, much, more pressure onto the, I mean, uh, hospitals and your uh, uh, health system. Uh, and uh, as you know that we are not up to that level, even if the America, Italy and uh, uh, Spain could not handle. So for us, I mean, it would be even much more complicated. So keeping in view that aspect, I think the first focus should be uh, to, to inculcate certain behavioral uh, I mean, uh, changes which are required uh, to deal with it. And that would not be possible. And unfortunately, up till now, I've already written an article about it that, uh, that was published in Business Recorder, that there is no unified, I mean, response provincial and the federal government. I mean, this kind of, this political uh, gimmickry that's going on around this issue is further complicating the issue because on one side, this is a very serious issue. But on the other side, people are taking it very lightly and because perhaps they think that it is kind of some, uh, some politics that's going on between the provinces and, for, and the federal government. Then the second aspect is that uh, once you, you are doing this, along with it, you need to have a very uh, concrete, concrete I mean, uh, employ, employment policy in which you are not going to give this, I mean, uh, cash transfer every quarter, that would not be possible. As, I mean, uh, Hassan has very uh, appropriately highlighted the kind of fiscal space government has, 
we cannot afford to have i mean uh, a very uh, uh, generous uh, i mean cash transfers in, the, in 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 their future but on the other side keeping in view that we, there would not be i mean large scale manufacturing and activity in the country there would not be uh, i mean uh, other i mean uh, economic options particularly for earning the livelihoods so then the it is government who will have to create some livelihood particularly by initiating some uh, i mean mega projects but labor intensive mega projects and might be if even you have to stop certain uh, i mean public sector investments public psdp uh, investments you have to stop for a while you 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 must stop them and create certain i mean like 100 days uh, employment program for the rural uh, i mean youth that could be i mean with the help of this you can create some i mean uh, you you know that most of our water uh, infrastructure is uh, downtrodden at the moment i mean since i mean 30 40 years no massive investment has been made in your canal system in your i mean uh, rural roads rural infrastructure is i mean in a dilapidated state and the government can come up with some i mean investment in those sectors uh, on a i mean uh, quick fix basis so that you are going to create 100 to 150 days job guarantee guaranteed jobs for the youth uh, and that's not i mean very for a very kind of a skilled labor force mm -hmm. once you are going to do that it is going to add some i mean breathing space uh, for those uh, who are not i mean uh, in uh, getting their livelihoods from the existing uh, situation that's going on at the moment then besides this there could be a third uh, strategy that government should uh, seriously consider and that's reskilling uh, the youth and certain i mean uh, I mean, even you could consider beyond youth. I mean, those who are in the age bracket of, uh, I mean, uh, 40, 45, and they are now supposed to lose their jobs in uh, from the existing uh, livelihood opportunities. How to, I mean, reskill them and then going to make them, I mean, again, uh, a kind of a viable uh, workforce for for getting their livelihoods from the from the future. Uh, I mean, uh, those industries which are now going to be highlighted, like particularly uh, e-commerce, as uh, Hassan Daoud has already highlighted, that certain policy was almost. Uh, I mean, when we were working for the government, I mean that that policy was almost in the in the final phase. Certain retweaks were required, but I mean, I don't know why this government is taking so much uh, time in finalizing that. Besides this. As uh, Asan uh, has also highlighted, that uh, only I mean incentive are not going to work particularly to attract the foreign direct investment. There would be cutthroat competition. I strongly agree with Asan on that aspect. So once there would be cutthroat competition, so what is needed beyond these incentives which we are offering? I mean, since last uh, five for five years. But yet there is no progress, uh, particularly on, uh, I mean, increasing the foreign direct investment in Pakistan. And there is, I feel, strongly feel that this is uh, what is the, uh, the policy framework of Pakistan. I mean, until and unless you are going to have a very coherent and stable policy framework, it is less likely that any foreign direct investor is simply going to respond to these incentives, particularly these fiscal incentives which we are offering. Yeah. This is not; these are not going to do any miracle until and unless we are not going to have a very robust policy framework. And I, as I have written uh, in, in Dawn, that article was published that we are at the moment we have 26 different federal level policies, which are decade old, most of them, and uh, recently few of them have been, uh, I mean, uh, revamped or uh, re reshaped. In, in last four or five years. And apart from that, most of them are decade old. Uh, I mean, eventually though those have lost their relevance and particularly those have lost their relevance in now, I mean, this context, which is, we are facing now. Yeah. And two things are very 
I mean, clear in this context. And one, uh, thanks to Nahid, she has already highlighted that it is now an era or where once again you have to look at indigenous sources of uh, growth because neither you, you can earn with the help of exports nor you would be able to I mean, simply export your labor force to the MENA region or to I mean, other developed worlds and they are going to give some resilience to your economic system. I, these two possibilities are, I feel, are, I mean, now over. And only it would be possible that if we are, you are going to have highly skilled labor force that could, I mean, help in digitization of the MENA region and some other, I mean, uh, developing countries like us. Uh, they could be able to get absorbed in the global uh, workforce. And beside this, now you have to rely heavily on your domestic, uh, I mean, production system, domestic okay. production uh, methodologies and strategies. Only then it would be possible that we are going to have certain kind of breathing space. Yeah. So, I mean, with these uh, four or five different aspects, if the government is going to focus on these aspects, only then it would be possible uh, that we can overcome slightly uh, some of the pitfalls and uh, some negative repercussions, those are over there. And as well as some of the positive repercussions, those are over there, uh, particularly having this, uh, I mean, digitization, internet of things, and this, uh, I mean, uh, 4G or, uh, I mean, this fourth industrial revolution, that would be now much more expedited because of this COVID, uh, I mean, kind of context. Thanks to COVID, you could say that that is the only, yeah. I mean, uh, silver lining uh, that is there in this crisis, uh, I, I feel. And yeah. only those countries which are going to respond to this uh, appropriately would be the winners in the next phase. Otherwise, yeah. uh, I think the situation would be much more worse for the countries like us. Thank sure. you. Sure. Uh, sure. Thank you. Uh, so very quickly, we're short in time and other uh, participants have engagements elsewhere as well. So very quickly, Nahid, uh, Saiba, if you can also comment on the way forward and so that uh, then I can go back to other participants as well. Yeah, sure. I will summarize this very quickly because um, I think um, we've almost got to the bottom line. The one thing I want to point out here is that unlike the 2008-2009 um, financial crisis, which then saw uh, the world looking at austerity um, and experimenting with austerity. Um, now, governments will be compelled to spend more and not less. Now, because they have to do much more. Now, the one key thing that I would say uh, that we perhaps have missed out is we're talking about um, FDI, we're talking about remaining, um, you know, a player in the game, uh, trying to bring in whether it's investment, trying to do business, trying to maintain some level of remittances coming in and so on. The winner will be the country which has a solid public health system. And my fear is that if we do not have a cohesive, a very, very solid public health strategy, we will stand nowhere in the world which is staring at us in our face. We will not be able to do it. Meaning I will not be able to travel, you will not be able to travel if you come from our country, which is absolutely nowhere when it comes to combating this disease and any other disease, which is, you know, probably around the corner for us. So now this is a no brainer. Public health has to be the first investment um, sort of um, game for us. If Pakistan has to remain competitive, if Pakistan has to uh, even earn a living for its workers or whatever that we need to do. So, sari investment aapne is tarike se karni hai ke you remain, uh, you, you remain a going concern. And if your public health system is, uh, you know, robust and we can actually then survive, we will be able to do the rest. Right now, what I see as far as the public health is concerned, I don't see what is going on. I mean, I see 10 different organizations. I don't know who does what, who's, who's supposed to do what, I have no clue. 
And talking about public health, I think um, I think Hassan pointed this out. This is going to be a major area for even private sector investment to come in, and we must focus on a lot of investment being uh, promoted, facilitated, etc. In public health, talking about austerity and how we can't experiment with that, and yet we would need to, you know, raise taxes. Tax rates will go up. Fiscal deficits are going to be very high. The government really needs to, and I pointed this out earlier. We need to be very sure about who will be taxed more, who will be taxed less, which industries become our backbone, where do we make our money, which industries will employ people. Forget about export for now, for heaven's sake. I mean, I, in my background, my family business is textiles. I've been hearing this for the longest time. Whilst the world is dying of COVID here, this government is talking about expanding and promoting export. And I'm thinking my orders have been canceled when they have been on the ship. They've been cancelled. So I'm fighting arbitration, uh, you know, suits and God knows what is going on here. The other industry which no one is talking about and no one is looking at closely is insurance. Big, huge impact here. Everything is going to be hit. We really need to rethink it. Um, why are investors coming out of industries like airlines? They're coming out of industries uh, like retail. People are backing out because all of these are going to be severely hit and the insurance premiums are going to be very high. We really need to rethink all of this. And the government has to you know, take a reality check as to what it is doing. Um, very quickly, just one word on SEZs because I spent a lot of my, the last few years of my life giving it a lot. Um, and Hassan pointed out, regulation and deregulation and how this really works this is all one has to rethink this i'm not i mean i won't waste a lot of time on this forum but even the secs need to be rethought um, agriculture sector i think that has a huge potential i think that we haven't done enough in it i think agro processing will be a big area where young people can also move towards it has to be encouraged i think the real estate sector has to be rethought of. Commercial real estate is no longer going to be as uh, valuable as it used to be. This is going to affect the residential real estate. One needs to sit down and think what is going to happen and what is not. So this needs to be addressed as well. Um, my bottom line is that when we think about going forward, we have to think about Pakistan as being, uh, you know, a sort of an independent kind of creature here. We need to think about what works for us internally, what industries do we promote, who do we tax, who we don't. And, and legacy has to go. Legacy has to go out of the window. So if the SEC Act was passed in 2010 and it had certain um, sort of caveats to it, let's readdress what is going on. I'm not even sure if it's actually feasible anymore. So time for government to really sit down and think. If first of all, first priority, keep people alive and keep people viable as citizens of the world. If your public health is where it is today, we will not remain viable. No one will meet us. No one will talk to us. We can't get onto airplanes. That's not what we want. And secondly, let's promote the industry which works for us. That's my bottom line. Very good takeaway points. Uh, Hassan, I will come back to you because what uh, Naheed has shared is very relevant to what you were talking about in terms of public-private partnerships and uh, reforms, soft reforms. So uh, I want a takeaway from, from you for, from this conversation. So please, if you can add to what Naheed said. So I'll just make a very short comment uh, because I also kind of covered this in my earlier comment. And I think the people on this panel uh, have all worked with government in senior positions, so I, the, the, the suggestions they are giving are very relevant. My only comment is that COVID-19 is an unprecedented crisis. And to manage that, we need to come up with an unprecedented policy response. Doing a bit of, bit more of what we have been doing already, which means that an incremental policy, reform, uh, policy response is not going to work. So without changing fundamentally how the government works, we are not going to end up at a viable solution. And I think the government would need to fundamentally rethink itself. I do see some positives coming out of it. So exa for example, when you look at the government's effort to open up ITP negotiations because of these pressures, I think that is something good that has come out of it. Uh, but I think the discussion needs to be they go, the discussion needs to go far beyond 
such things. Um, and I think I can go on and on, but I think I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Bilal, uh, also I would like uh, I would like you to add to it, and in terms of uh, uh, that, how policy response can rely on the perceptions of the people and uh, the uh, behaviors of the people, because your organization has done a lot to engage that. So, policy response in the light of the actual experiences of the people in this regard, if you would like to add that. Sure. I, I, th I think one of the um, one of the additions to the conversation can be that uh, uh, we're, we're looking at both economic uh, policy measures, but we also need to look at the broader political economy uh, question here. So when we talk about investments in Pakistan, uh, we talk about local investments, but we also talk about international investments in Pakistan, because as any third world country, we are a resource trapped. Uh, country and for um, unleashing the potential, there has to be foreign investment. So one of my points would be to um, as the as the, the the political landscape in the in the world reshapes itself. Uh, I think there is no doubt that uh, the power shift from the west to the east, um, the the China and the, the U.S. rivalry. Uh, the the greater sort of political alignment with uh, with America, India, um, and China, Pakistan, Russia um, uh, realignment. I think uh, in in the previous decades, uh, one of the mistakes that Pakistan has done is uh, not to um, do the realignment in a correct way. Um, so, in the, as we talk about more micro level issues, we need to also think about the macro political economy of the of this issue. I think it all it is also quite crucial to look at the power distribution within the country. So, as we talk about um, uh, policy reforms, we need to also think about uh, the fact that in the crisis times, we don't trample over the long earned, uh, hard earned political. Um, consensus that we've developed because uh, reforms are only good as uh, to the extent of the the implementation that happens through them so and without institutions the implementation is going to be very stopgap uh, that's a 70 year lesson in pakistan that uh, policies have been fairly robust but the implementation has lagged uh, we've had bursts of growth and then tumbling down um, and that's but partly because of the institutional crisis. So as we look at all of the, the policy responses, we need to also look at the, the civil military relations does not get um, uh, unduly uh, uh, lopsided in one direction, which is already lopsided, but we don't want to further lopsided the federal versus the provincial power debate. Um, and in order for us uh, as a post COVID response, the, the federal versus provincial debate has to be settled in a more meaningful form. The local versus the provincial um, debate. So uh, the COVID response has to be at the local government level as well. And then the third, um, um, it is to some extent regulatory reform, but it is also a larger question of what is the role of the state in Pakistan. Um, so uh, the one of the largest challenges uh, in terms of regulatory reform is to let the businesses, let the communities, let uh, let let individuals uh, be able to prosper on their own, with the government being a helping hand. Um, so we, if if we were to do what we have done before in a in a more um, pronounced way, that's not going to help. Um, as Hassan was saying, this is a very unprecedented um, uh, crisis, and one of the the one of the fixes that we really need to do is to let the state get out of many many businesses, many many legal structures, um, and let the, the society's potential unleash itself. Without doing that, we would be regurgitating. Um, uh, the, the the this is I mean as you were saying uh, what can public uh, opinion inform us I think all of these three are what of what the public opinion also informs us they want to be part be participating in the growth they want they want a share not just in the economic um, 
uh, gain out of it, but they also want to be uh, contributing to the to the structure. They want a more lawful Pakistan in which um, things are not just handled by the by the by the federation, but the provinces and the local governments are also uh, allowed to prosper and function. Uh, and um, the the regional disparities that we have, um, and Pakistan has trailed behind uh, in the 70 years, not just because of our policy failures, not just because of our economic failures, but we have also failed because of our lack of power distribution um, uh, in a in a in a consensual manner, in which we left out many segments of the society, many segments of the geography. So I, I mean my. I think the, a lot of meaningful discussion happened, but we need to also think about the political economy context of it, because without doing that, we wouldn't be able to have a sustainable solution to the post-COVID world. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, uh, Hassan Daoud uh, uh, I would like you to also comment on what potential policy responses the government and the private sector and civil society at large can put together uh, against this COVID-19 outbreak? You know, I've lived in China for, for half of my professional life. Wherever I teach and wherever I work, people ask me, how can we be like China and get this the same sort of economic growth that China has? And my answer to all of them is that, are we willing to sacrifice the way that China did you know, like one child policy, look at them, look at their response during COVID. So are we willing to, and this is uh, somewhat relevant to what uh, Dr. Nadeem said in terms of our behavior, uh, you know, uh, at, at a society level. So if, unless we are not willing to sacrifice, I do not see much change coming. Uh, this is the best time to deregulate. This is the best time to look at new innovative ideas in terms of digital Pakistan. But whether that would happen would largely depend on how we behave. So far, uh, I, would, I would leave the response to all of you, whether we have uh, demonstrated ourselves as a more disciplined country, unless we discipline ourselves for at, at all levels. And that means uh, at uh, how do we deal with business, how we deal with relationship, how do we deal with the promises that we make? We promise so much in terms of when we are attracting investment and then when it comes, when we, when we have the bird caged, we take most of those incentives away. So I think we need to improve our uh, discipline uh, at government level. And I said earlier, uh, I, I think our governance structure need to be taken. Uh, we have been speaking about uh, SCZs since 2016. I've been debating, arguing about how fast we should. Nahid has been, uh, and even Dr. Nadeem Sa, we've all been running like chickens with that cut off. Uh, but I, I think we're still where we are, where perhaps we were on day one. So uh, I, I, I think my three points, just to sum up, is discipline empathy and perhaps benevolence. And, and I think we need more benevolent leadership, leadership with uh, larger vision, much beyond than uh, and at all level, at, at, uh, at provincial level, as well as um, uh, with more pragmatic approach and with an approach to solve problems, not to create problems. That's it. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you. Um, it has been a wonderful conversation and we have discussed at length uh, that what are the challenges we are facing and we have uh, come to a conclusion that yes, we are face facing an unprecedented challenge in, in the shape of COVID-19 outbreak that has resulted in low business confidence, that has resulted in a hit uh, when it comes to the remittances Pakistan has been a uh, recipient of, when it has come to the growth rate, across different sectors, whether it's the large scale manufacturing industries or small and medium, small and medium enterprises. So the, so the economic challenge is there, but we have also discussed that uh, there are opportunities in the current economic landscape that originate from Pakistan's strategic uh, uh, importance geographically and Pakistan's 
the shape of Pakistan's economy, which is uh, far more uh, dependent upon domestic factors, which is why the global impact is limited at multiple levels. And we can look into responses which are essentially inclusive uh, and uh, which thrive upon the political gains or the economic gains we have made in the past and which can further uh, uh, reevaluate the policies in place which might be uh, not so effective and efficient because the scenarios and the factors have changed uh, due to this COVID. And we've talked about the importance of uh, uh, letting go the austerity measures and uh, state coming up with a fiscal response, but we have also talked that how this fiscal response is limited because the state's capacity is limited. Um, so I think at, at large are of the view that Yes, the challenge is big, but the response can be equally big and we can uh, survive and we can sail through the age of COVID. And although the World Health Organization is saying that COVID is here to stay, but then again, we have to live with it. So thank you once again to all of you for being part of this wonderful conversation. We will be putting together a policy brief in the light of the discussion held and we will be sharing with you, with the government and all of the major stakeholders. So once again, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Emma. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.